Hi, I'm Kirsten. I'm the CEO of WIF and so excited to be here today with uh, many of the team behind The Woman King. We're going to talk about this exceptional film and how they uh, brought it to screen and uh, are bringing the story to life. Um, one of the things I am most excited about is that this film is going to live in the canon. So it's going to be a film that's going to be taught in film schools, that children are going to grow up watching, that teenagers are going to love, that it really is going to have a life so far beyond even this moment. So um, really kudos to all of you for the incredible work you've done just to, to make this film. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to start with, with you, Gina. Um, you know, it's been, the film's been, been out for four months. Um, I know you've screened um, in, in many incredible places. What does it feel like now that it, that it is with audiences? Mm -hmm. um, you. It's, you know, it's an amazing thing to go through the process that we all did to bring this film to life. It's, I, I think it, as a collective, both crew and cast, we could all say this was the hardest film we've ever done. Um, but we went through it because we believe so deeply in the story, um, in what we were doing, in the importance of it, uh, in the beauty of it. And I think that that belief sustained all of us. So to be on this side of it now, um, and as you said, we've traveled the world showing the film and the beauty of the same reaction, whether it's in LA or Toronto or Paris or London or South Africa or Nigeria, Benin, I, it's the same. And that's as filmmakers, that's what you dream of, that your work can transcend everything, color, race, gender. Um, and it's, it's just been a really beautiful ride. Kathy, um, uh, I know you worked on this for many, many years before even bringing all of these incredible people together. Um, can you talk a little bit about just putting this team together? And also, you've been awarded the, the Reframe stamp, which we're super excited about here at, at Women in Film. Um, it is, you know, the, the brainchild of Kathy Shulman and to have <laughs> so many women working on this, this project has been really incredible. Yeah, I mean, the amazing thing I think about the film from start to finish is it was the support of women that got it made. You know, um, it, really the whole way through, it, it, it was when we finally were able to sell the picture to TriStar, it was Hannah Mangella who was at the time, you know, um, not only the president of, of TriStar, but also working alongside me as the president of Women in Film. And, and I remember saying very much to Hannah that like, if we can't get this done, who can? Like we have to walk the walk and talk the talk. And, and that carries all the way to the reframe stamp, you know, at the other end. And I'll, I'll go back and talk about putting together this incredible team, but you know, the reframe stamp, you know, obviously, and the whole concept of reframe was to try to start making systemic change, you know, from the top down in the industry. And the concept behind it is that, you know, we can't just fight up, up all the time. We need decision makers at the top to make change that allows decision making at every different juncture of the filmmaking process to favor uh, women and diversity, at least at a 50-50 level. And so I remember saying to Hannah, then, you know, president of TriStar and also working, you know, on the women in film and reframe, you know, um, you know, agenda that if we didn't make this decision from the top, if she didn't make this decision from the top, then we really weren't proving our point. And it was that door that opened. And even though Hannah, you know, eventually left TriStar, you know, it was because uh, her second in command there was Nicole Brown, also involved with women in film and a black woman who really pushed through a system that I think in many ways would have uh, ultimately failed to enable a film like this if it hadn't been for the women involved. And then that comes back to all of us. And it was just an extraordinary experience, you know, starting with Dana, um, you know, we had this idea, uh, Maria Bello had come back from a trip to Benin with the concept of making a movie about the Agajia warriors. And, and we were kind of in no man's land for a long time as to which part of the 500 year history to identify and to find like the dramatic, you know, core to, and it was Dana who ultimately 
figured that out. It was her pitch that won the day. And I'm sure she'll talk more about this later. And once we had a screenplay that was in um, really nice shape and she went through multiple drafts and, and somehow weathered the whole studio system to do that and mastered it um, and didn't manage to keep the picture on track. Then we had the incredible opportunity of, you know, finding our director and went to Gina. And, you know, obviously the magic moment was when Gina said she would direct the movie and um, that made it all possible. And we felt that Gina was, if you don't mind my saying this with you sitting here, you know, at the perfect moment in her life and career, you know, coming off of a big action movie she had just done, you know, from Netflix, but also with a, with a canon of films that everybody in the female filmmaking community loves so deeply starting with love and basketball that like if the combination of the intimate and the epic which she later became became sort of her you're going to talk about this I'm sure but became sort of her managing principle but if we could have both both Gina's intimate and her epic (laughs) coming to this movie it would be the perfect you know step and then with Gina came Terry um they've been working together for a whole life they'll talk about that and um, Gersha, well, Gersha, and there's so many more, by the way, how amazing that I could do this all day because actually the entire crew was, was, was female led, but speaking for the people that are on this, you know, movie right now that are on this particular zoom right now, um, you know, Gersha was able to, you know, take a look at, you know, what the historical facts were, you know, for the Agogia warriors and translate it into a modern approach in a way that was so brilliant. I remember when Gina and I first saw it, we just knew in two minutes that Gersha was the one. And we were texting each other, you know, on the Zoom like you do in people's interviews. So it's been an incredible thing. And I didn't even talk about the actors. And of course, Viola was involved from the beginning. And, you know, but it's just been the most extraordinary all female led, you know, experience on a studio level. That's a first for me. I believe that it took, you know, 35 years of a career to get to a place where I could be helpful in pushing a movie like this through the system at this level and at this budget. And by the way, the budget wasn't even enough, but we managed it. But but it's it's so far beyond what anyone has done with a non-IP female um, mainstream film that, you know, it, it was an uphill climb from moment one. Sorry, that was such a big question. It was too big an answer. Move on to the next person. But <laughs> okay, we'll, come, we'll come back to you, Kathy. Too um, much. I, I want yeah. to <laughs> no. spend a minute talking about, about the script, Dana, and how, um, and I mean, it's a beautiful piece of fiction that is obviously based on history, um, and how you decided sort of what moment to, to focus on. Um, let's start with that. I I was really fascinated by a lot of the research and stories from all the different time periods, but there was something about, uh, I I was very adamantly looking for a time period and a moment where, number one, the Agoji warriors emerged triumphant, Mm -hmm. and also that we are seeing this world that they live in through their eyes. We, We have this great opportunity with our dual protagonists of Nawi and Naniska, you know, Nawi is being brought into this world and we are being brought into this world through her eyes. But we also have Naniska who's been living it and who understands the political dramas. She understands the the relationship that her king and her country are having with these new uh, people that come and bring the slave trade with them, the white people. I just really wanted to tell the story from the Agoji point of view and sometimes with, if I looked at something a little bit later, like the 1890s, they were, they were defeated by the French. And also there would be a lot of, of uh, seeing them through the eyes of the French. And I just didn't, I didn't want to have that white gaze onto the movie. I really wanted it to not, not have too much of that. And I'm very proud of the fact that there's only really one white person speak, who has a speaking role in the movie. Um, but I found this uh, this period, this 1823, where they conquered a, a, a long um, uh, suffering foe that they had, the Oyo. And then I looked up the Oyo and they, they were just so amazing looking with these robes and, and they're, you know, riding horseback. And I just got very excited about that time period. And then I discovered that Gezo was a new king, that he got there by via a coup that Yagoji helped him. And I thought, what a great relationship for Naniska to have with this young king. And uh, and I also wanted to talk about the politics and the transatlantic slave trade. 
And mm -hmm. I wanted to see that, that one of the first scenes in the movie is this council scene where they talk about this. We, we, we go ahead and face it head on. I'm, I'm glad you, you chose that moment. I think it, it, um, it's important historically and also makes for good storytelling. Um, I did read somewhere that um, one of the last of the women warriors was alive in like 1979. Um, just wondering if you were able to find anything about her from her perspective. Well, only that we stole her name. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, you know, I certainly looked at what she had to say and uh, what, what we were able to find that she could share. I also looked at some stuff from, uh, you know, the Zora Neale Hurston book, Barracoon talks about the women warriors. Of course, it's over 60 years after our takes place. But um, I looked at as many, you know, sort of eyewitness accounts as I could. Um, and it's, it's thrilling to know that at least one of these warriors lived all the way into our century. It made us, it made it feel very real, relevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And hopefully because of this film, um, some more of this will get into history textbooks and be part of exactly. regular yeah. Um, education and, and, and discourse. Um, Gersha, I wanted to talk a little bit about the costumes, which are extraordinary, so beautiful and, and well um, thought out and crafted. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about the process of both designing and, and making them? Sure. Um, I mean, I think, you know, as usual, we start with research and story and that sort of um, dictated what we were going to do. When I presented to um, Gina and Kathy, you know, I was looking for, I knew we wanted to do a, we needed a battle uniform um, and maybe a palace look, look, I think. I think I wasn't as clear in the beginning of how many different changes we would need to do. To do. But as, you know, through talking with Gina, we did sort of evolve it into um, a much more, um, I would say, maybe complex costumes than I thought, a wardrobe that I thought we were going to go with. But, um, you know, we had the battle uniform and, and nailing that was our, you know, the first, the first thing I was trying to do. And I do remember, you know, first um, Googling the Egoji and seeing the pictures of them with the plumes on the head and, and that whole, that look, and, and then trying to find that in written, written text, a description of that. And it was really hard to find that. And I couldn't find that. I remember, I think it was maybe my second or third interview with Gina. I was saying, I can't find this description of this uniform anywhere. And I'm wondering if it's something else. And so we started looking at the palace tunic. And then I think at that time I was thinking, well, maybe more the palace tunic is the way to go for the actual uniform. Because one of the descriptions I did find was this sort of sackcloth um, tunic that they wore for fighting. But we ended up on the other going more with the um, the battle uniform that we did pick, um, just in terms of trying to create, you know, a very distinct look for the battle and 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 what that could be. And I knew that I wanted to incorporate indigo into their uniforms, just because you know indigo is such a big um, uh, textile that's used a lot within Western um, Africa. And it's it was also part of our story. We had uh, the vats that we had outside the palace. Um, and we see that when now he comes in to see the, to seize and sees the, uh, the women working on the indigo and she thinks it's heads in there actually. But, um, you know, and I think, so I, the, 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 the uniform came together really quite simply that we knew that they bound their chests we found these pictures where they would bear these straps wrapped around their necks that looked like halters, but they weren't really halters. They would look, they looked more like they, they were used to hold their weapons. But we decided that we could, you know, cheat a halter from that. So that's where those things came from. Um, the wrap cloth was basically what they did wear, and they also wore men's shorts. So those were the three components that we knew we had for that costume. And then we went and added on, you know, the belts and the, and and some many uh, some other different things like that, the cross belts as well, and created things for hierarchies, different hierarchies within within the regiment. Um, and then, uh, you know, wanting to give Naniska um, something that stood out more in terms of her look. So we created the breastplate um, and added the calories to that. And, you know, we used different things um, that were like talismans for them because they were, you know, they were quite spiritual and in their fighting, they always had um, different um, talismans that they carried with them that were for protection, et cetera. And one of the things we did find out really early in research that not only was a cowrie shell, 
you know, used for monetary, for currency, it was also used as protection. So that was kind of another nice way to infuse that into their costumes and into their battle costumes. Um, we also created uh, symbols where well, we didn't create the symbols. We found symbols that were in the West, the Western um, African diaspora that um, had different meanings like courage and um, uh, I can't think of all the things right now, but just different things that we actually infused into the costumes as well. And um, we allowed each actor to pick their own symbols that they wanted to put on their costumes. So, so we would put them in either we uh, tooled them in or we made jewelry pieces and things like that. And that's basically the warrior uniform. And then we also did similar things with their palace tunics, which is the costume that's the striped tunic dress. And that, um, that was... Uh, the, we found the fabric through um, some research that the art department had done from a, a museum in Paris, and it described the strip weave fabric that they used to make it. So we knew we needed to find the strip weave fabric. So we actually ended up, you know, through a process, getting it made in Ghana, in northern Ghana, and then having it shipped to us in in in, in uh, Cape Town. And that was a, its own journey in itself. But that's how that came together. And then, you know, just um, I'm trying to think of other things. At this, the you know, that's that's the wives, and then and then also the wives and the king, you know, and coming up with all of that look, and just trying to create, like, you know, I think, you know, it was in terms of seeing the 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 um the kingdom as now he sees it sort of i think that was a really it's a good point that you know as we come in the first thing that we see is Nawi at her farm and then we come into the town with Nawi into the village so we see the village and all the people in the village and then we go into the palace we see the palace then we see the the, the um the king the wives and the courtiers and his ministers so you know trying to create sort of like a little echelon each time we saw a different group of people so that we we felt the wealth of the kingdom really resided with the king and his his wives and and his ministers so that's sort of like well, a big picture. Sorry, <laughs> a lot yeah. to talk about. <laughs> um, I I really I, I liked all the costumes, but you know I was particularly drawn to to the wives. Yeah, um, <laughs> and their like the, the glamour of, of their love. Thank you. Yeah, that was, and that's a, a big nod to Gina too, because I felt, I remember doing our first set of fittings with them. I hit some of those notes, but you know, I thought I started with a little less. Um, I would say glamorous, maybe, or a little more pared down. And she was like, they have to look different than the town, the, you know, from the from the people in the town. And so we, you know, we went at it again and, and just upped the notch and and came up with some other ideas and different ways of wrapping fabrics and also just used more elevated fabrics, silks. And then we took silks and we printed on the silks. We dyed it different colors and then we printed on it and um, so on and came up the looks. So yeah, it was a great, it was a really fun and crazy exercise to go on and journey, I have to say, but it, it's um, looking back at it, we're really, really proud of what we were able to accomplish. The palette of the film is really gorgeous. And I imagine, Gina, that's you kind of setting that that tone, um, literally, um, mm -hmm. for, for the film. It comes through in the costumes and in the, in the, um, in the village, uh, even when they're outside, like it's just the, the colors are so beautiful. We mm -hmm. can you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that was really important. Um, you know, through the years, and it's very rare, certainly, that any film is set on the continent. Um, but when it is, it, it seems to have that same kind of look of just dry and, and dusty. And in our research that we did, what was so exciting was to hear descriptions of the kingdom, um, of the palace, of the lushness, the beauty of it, the colors of it. And so we really wanted to dive into that. And the more I looked at pictures from Benin, which is modern day Dahomey, the thing that stood out the most was this incredible red earth and the contrast of that to the lush green um, that surrounds them. I knew that that was going to be the anchor and, you know, the interesting thing is, I hope, you know, when you look at the film, that redness is just there and it's, everything came from that. The palace was obviously built from, from the, the natural clay that was there. So it shared the color, but all of that, we had to create that, that red earth um, because it wasn't there. Um, but it, uh, it took a while to find that right alchemy of the, the right color, but Again, everything stemmed from that and, and just the 
mantra of let's really portray this kingdom as it was described and show the beauty of the kingdom, beauty of the people. Um, and uh, I think across the board, every department did that. Terry, uh, one of the things that um, was really effective for me as a, as a viewer is um, there's these you know intense battle scenes, um, but it, every time it cuts, it cuts right before it's sort of too bloody or, or too gory. Um, and I'm somebody who watches um, a lot of movies like this. <laughs> and I didn't because of the, I think the way it was edited. So can you talk a little bit about the sort of philosophy behind the editing and, and then how you achieved what you did? I think for me, the, you know, philosophy kind of, uh, philosophy comes from the material that is is brought into you know that comes into my editing room uh, the conversations that I have in pre-production production post-production post with Gina I mean you know first of all my responsibility in hearing all these artists talk is to make sure that I'm facilitating the intention through the footage and the material that's coming in and so I think that really when it came to the battle scenes um what I hoped was that by the time we got there, that you were so invested in these women, these warriors, these these uh, these characters who have shown us their power, but also their vulnerability. So within cutting the action itself, I mean, a big part of it is obviously the storytelling of two people coming into conflict, um, two characters coming into conflict. And at the same time, it's also kind of, seeing who these women are when they're faced with the most incredible adversity. Mm -hmm. And so I think within the fight itself, it was less about the slashing and dicing and blood spewing and as you know, other films might be. And to me, it was more about showing their resilience and their strength and the ability to, to, to the reason why they're able to conquer their, their, um, their foes is because of how they fight, how they choose to fight, how they choose to move, how they choose to, you know, from the whole notion of them oiling themselves down, they had to be faster and smarter and, and, and just, you know, you know, they just had to be smarter warriors. Um, and so I think that um, part of it was uh, finding those pieces finding those that choreography that was that was done with Gina and Danny Hernandez our our, our stunt coordinator and um, basically they all found each and, and part of it too was also focusing that each warrior <clears throat> though they worked together had their own fighting style and that was something that Gina and Danny talked about a lot about giving each women woman warrior their agency so for me, it was really, again, facilitating that and, and finding those, those moments. And I think that um, we can find in a lot of movies, whether it's The Woman King or if you're watching even a horror movie or something, your imagination is infinitely more you know, powerful and visceral than what you may see on screen at times. And so I, I think that this wasn't a film where you needed that, where you needed to see, I didn't want you to cover your eyes. I wanted you to be able to watch and, and feel these women and their power. You definitely did that. And um, there also there's, there's not an extra moment in it. Like everything feels cut so well um, and, and timed, timed so well, which I, I think it's just a testament to your skill. <laughs> well, it, it was it was certainly a privilege and a challenge. I think with this type of film, what I loved about it was it was always important for us to 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 whatever whether it was an intimate moment or the epic moment, that it was always character driven and everything was deliberate. The time that we took to stay with a character, at the time that we took if we chose to help, if I chose to hold on a moment with Naniska to allow you as an audience to have a private moment with her, mm -hmm. the moments that we had between Amenza and Naniska when they needed to unpack the 19 years of, of you know, um, hearing a, a piece of news. I mean, I mean, again, part of the reason why I, I think this film is so special is because yes, you have these action moments and, and that's kind of the way that was, the, in, of course, the intention, but the intention was to make a historical drama with some really badass action where you cared about the characters. And, and I have to, again, go back to the script and, and Gina's intention and, and um, everybody doing 
what they were supposed to do in the world building and then giving me this remarkable material that I could just dive into and um, hopefully honor the intention of every department and what they were trying to do. And it's a, it was truly a, a gift. Gina, you said earlier that um, this was uh, the most challenging film that you've made and that probably everybody on this team has made. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about what, um, you know, what you learned or wisdom that you, you might want to impart to other directors? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, when you embark on something like this, the bigness of it, you know, you the the pressure's immense and the pressure's even more immense when, you know, you're trying to do something of this size and you need more days or a little more money, but you don't have it and you have to get it done. So it is a, you either get crushed by that pressure or you embrace it. And we all, I mean, certainly across the board, we all embrace that pressure and it, it, pushed us to work harder, but we're all built for that. And that's what I love. Everybody were warriors. And it was so much a theme of on screen, but behind the scenes to really yeah. obliterate this, this unfounded belief that women are not fighters, that we're not warriors, that, that we're not strong, that we're not fierce. Um, but also that our vulnerability is absolutely a strength as well. And in, in the way that we were able to tap into that and it was extraordinary to see everyone step up in such a big way and do their best work. And then the actors as well, these women who had never, except for Lashana, had never done fighting or stunts before or training like this before to be able to do their own fighting and stunts and to have actors who at some point were hurt. And that's just a... a it happens when you're doing these type of films. You should never get injured, uh, but you will get hurt at some point. And all of them pushing through. Um, I remember with Battle Dance, you know, I think at that point everybody had gotten this virus and this bug that was attacking everyone. But yeah. literally, yeah. Adrian, she's giving Adrian Warren giving volume 10 during the dance. As soon as I said cut, she is literally collapsed. Mm -hmm. um that's how sick she was and then you, I would say action and you could not tell and Lashana who had a foot injury same thing volume 10 I say cut and they're collapsed but they lifted each other up they pushed each other they dug deeper than they ever thought because they wanted to tell the story so much and in the right way and honor these these true life warriors um it was a really inspiring environment to be a part of. Kathy, for you as a producer, what were um, sort of the biggest challenges and or lessons that, that you would want to share with other producers? Well, you know, I think it was very important to us that we, in shooting on the continent, that we also hired people from, you know, Africa, from all over Africa, not only South Africa, but also the rest of um, the countries and you know the challenge in doing that is that you're pulling together a team of people who haven't necessarily worked together before you're staffing departments with people who haven't necessarily worked with that department head but you know philosophically um it was crucial to us that we had that authenticity and you know i just feel it's also possible and that, that we should we have to really push ourselves to you know make sure that we you know, higher diversely and culturally and, and culturally in terms of the authenticity of where we're working and then, you know, set up systems to embrace each other's differences and to understand, you know, how to create a collaborative effort. And it takes a lot to do it. And there were times when we were very frustrated from everyone coming from different, you know, sort of points of view and amounts of knowledge and, and all of that. But, you know, I really think it's crucial that, you know, as producers, we do this and it's just always, it's hard to work really far away. I mean, that's, that's just, you know, a lot of what the challenge was and we were hit, you know, with Omicron and when it first, you know, emerged, nobody knew, you know, it was the first aspect of the virus that was breaking through, you know, the um, barriers Absolutely. that had been, the, what did you say? The vaccinations. Vaccinations, I couldn't even think of the word. 
um, the vaccinations. And so, um, you know, that was a whole challenge in itself too. But again, like it's what Gina said, that it's just about, you know, you have to go into this like warrior mode. And and I and it's funny, like, you know, Gina was saying that, you know, there we had the warriors on screen and then we were the warriors sort of behind screen. But I also think it's, it's, it's so much the message of the movie for young women, you know, particularly for girls is that everybody has this, you know, inner warrior and, and it's, it's about like, you know, rising to the challenges and thinking that nothing is impossible. And this movie really proved it, you know, in terms of the making of it, but I also think it's the message of it. And, um, you know, you just go into this like, you know, <laughs> mode, this like production mode that we all, you know, everyone who's worked in production knows that you just, you push yourself to the limits to the point that afterwards you completely collapse. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's worth every moment of it. And, and again, like Gina said, you know, to just take away, you know, we pushed the studio to the limit of what, you know, how much money they felt we could, you know, earn back and all that kind of thing. And then you take what you have and you, you know, you readdress, you know, the Gina, uh, Dana's script was, was built a, a, around an enormous flood event um, that we frankly, which was, you know, that the, the, the OIO, you know, created a, and, and flooded out the Dahomey, you know, and, and uh, we couldn't do it. <laughs> so that, for example, was like a really good, you know, lesson in, you know, how to flex because the, the central concept of the, um, you know, kind of action event of the movie was built around a flood and we switched it to fire. And so like things like that, that you had to do um, just to, you know, keep your head above water, but just to, you know, to vision keep it, to, to remember where you're headed and to, and, and, and to stay on track and to never, never, ever let anyone, let anyone's no stop you, I guess. It's really what it is. I mean, I wish it was more profound, but that's what it is. It's working through the nose. Kirsten, can I add one thing uh, to, to your question, which is, you know, in speaking to filmmakers who are listening and, and also, um, crew is as directors it's and especially female directors it's so important for us to look past a resume um yeah. because so often um our resumes are not as extensive not because of lack of talent but lack of opportunity and certainly when you start to play in this bigger sandbox you're not seeing that that type of work on the resume but it is you know terry came came with me through everything but Gersha and Akeem McKenzie, who was a production designer, um, to as an example, who didn't have this big thing on the resume, but their passion for doing this like superseded that. And that's the other thing. Understand how important for a filmmaker, if I'm sitting in front of you and, and talking to you about coming aboard as, as part of the team, passion means a lot. And if you come in that room and you are somebody that I see and want to be in the trenches with, it it really means a lot. So come in prepared, um, come in passionate, um, and don't be afraid if your resume doesn't speak to the work ahead. Um, if you believe in yourself and believe in your talent, um, that will shine through. And, and, you know, we as filmmakers, it's important for us to see that. You know, it's interesting you say that because one of the reframe tool in the re reframe toolkit, you know, you know, one of the most important tenets of the concept of reframe is that in looking at resumes, we look at specificity of particular um, experiences and qualities as opposed to length of resume or size. And one of the key things I think um, a size of films to remember is that it's not about how big a film that you've worked on, you know, a bigger film that's more expensive just means there's more days. You still do the same thing every day. And, and so it's really important to remember and to urge anyone who's involved in hiring that, you know, it's not about how much the budget of the movie was that you worked on, you know, in, in any particular craft, it's about the quality of the work you did on a daily basis. And Reframe really tries to, you know, encourage that kind of hiring. As um, women are moving up into bigger budget productions, um, is there anything that's important for department heads to, to know and, and to think about? Like, is it really, you know, if you've got the passion and the vision, you can do it. Is there, is there, are there, is there any advice that, that um, you would have Gersha or, or Terry um, for people in your, you know, in your craft? <laughs> I think it's it's good to do your research when you're hiring your crew and and um, you know make sure that you're hiring people that are going to be able to to be with you through the trenches. I think that's important as well. And and um, you know I think for me personally, 
Um, sometimes I don't necessarily do that and I don't do my own research and, and follow through and, and, you know, do a couple checks on resumes and, and also just look at the work that they did, because I think that's also really important is, you know, like Kathy said and Gina said, it's like, look at the work that's on their resume and see how that translates to what you're doing and if it's going to work, because I think that's something, those are some of the things I know that I kind of missed when I was looking at, at, at um, crew and things like that, that could have serviced me better. So that's, that's, those are things that I think are really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would really say, especially in editing, you know, the talent is there. Um, there are so many young, um, you know, I don't really say up and coming, but are editors, but editors that are on a trajectory. And, you know, I, I tell them, I say it, it, you know, you have to have, you know, passion, persistence, patience, and you have to be prepared. Um, for that opportunity. And in terms of getting that opportunity, I think part of it, a lot of it is kind of getting past the firewall of um, getting an interview. And I think, you know, I, I try to, I know with uh, certainly assistants that have worked in my cutting room that are then, you know, moving into editing, I always tell them, you know, they, you know, they'll ask me, can I use you as a reference? And I say, absolutely. And, and often I get those calls from people who take the time to check with, you know, when you when you're an artist and you're saying, you know, this is who I am, and please check out the people I've worked with before. Um, I've I've often said, look, you know, I stand behind this person, and you're not going to ever have to reach me. You're never going to have to call me after you hire this person. But if you do, I've got their back, you know. And sometimes it's just, you know, giving someone who you know has the talent whatever you can try to do to get them that next opportunity. And, and they have to do everything they can. You're right, to do the research, to see, you know, to, you know, uh, reach out to the, the people who that they kind of would like to ideally work with. You're not always going to get um, a response back, but there will be filmmakers out there that will take the time um, you know, when you're in an interview with an editor, it, it, you know, you can assume every editor that's coming through that door pretty much got there because they can edit, but what's going to distinguish you from someone else? I mean, I spend with Gina and other directors anywhere from, you know, three to 23 hours in a cutting room with them talking story and not just editing. So there's a lot, there's a lot there. And I just, I just really wish there'd be more filmmakers that would take the time to recognize the talent, do a little extra homework, have your assistant, you know, call people that they've worked with, you know, because, but what you will find when you go out of your unfamiliar territory, when you go into a place that's unfamiliar, there can be quite extraordinary things happen. And that's true with your crew and finding that right crew. You'll surprise yourself. Well, you all are certainly shiny examples of people who have pushed, um, to, to make the change in the industry. It's, um, it's slow moving, but um, we, we are seeing the, the shift um, and keep, keep at it. I'm excited to see what everybody here does next. Um, and we wanna be part of that journey at, at Women in Film and to help support um, your individual careers and also the films that you make to make sure they get audiences. Um, and looking forward to the next couple of, of months and all the different awards shows and the guilds. And um, we've got a lot of winners on the screen and i um, excited to, to see you take some home, take some of those trophies home. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.